Hi folks, this is a video on how coastal landscapes are affected by erosion. It's a counterpart to the video I did on sea level change. Now at the end of the video on sea level change, I talked about whole sands, where the beach was removed, affected the sediment cell, and it led to a town being destroyed. However, it's not quite as simple as that, because erosion is a combination of physical and human processes. So before we start thinking about these, we need to think about the risk factors. What is it that leads to greater erosion rates? Linked into the sea level changes, what else we got? You are at risk um, of greater erosion if there's a long fetch, so a very long distance that the waves are travelling, if they are destructive waves, if the waves are 90 degree perpendicular to the coast, so they're destructive and they're slamming straight into it, that also puts them at risk, because there's going to be more erosion happening at that stage from those destructive waves. However, strong uh, longshore drift, which comes from very diagonal waves, is also a risk. So the strong um, those strong movements cause the sediment to be moved away very, very quickly. So strong LSD is definitely a risk. Seaward dip of the rock is tilted towards the ocean. More chance of erosion going on. Faulting in the rock as well, if it's weaker in some way. Uh, but also the geology and the lithology, so the type of rocks and the nature of those rocks, all of these are risk factors. Human factors, though, also come into play. Dredging, so removing sediment from the sediment cell, is going to change the way that the erosion works. And damming, if you take the river Nile, the Aswan Dam blocked the River Nile and it reduced the amount of sediment that got into the ocean, which had massive effects further down the coast. So I mention hall sands. Well, down on Dorset, very long fetch. Destructive waves from the change in the beach profile. Not so much the 90 degree rocks, but uh, waves, sorry, but strong longshore drift, removing the sediment very quickly, so a very quick change in the dynamic equilibrium. The dip of the rocks less important, but uh, the, uh, the rocks themselves, uh, because of the geology and the lithology, were quite steep, steep cliffs. So not very much um, steepness in the beach profile to dissipate that wave energy. The energy of the waves is dissipated if you've got a long beach. So shortened beach profile, steep cliffs, more energy hitting hall sands. And of course, all of this came from the dredging, digging up the sediment cell. Damming, not so much an issue here. But the point is hall sands is a mixture of all of these things. All of these human and physical factors coming together to cause a submergent, retreating coastline, going down, but also retreating back. Now erosion rates change according to time and also according to space. So there are variations between summer and winter erosion. Winter storms tend to lead to more destructive waves just because of the nature of the oceans and also um, because of the nature of winter and temperatures the rocks tend to be weaker more chance for freeze thaw weathering and other uh, weathering processes storms and wind direction change over time as well so one day might be calm another day might be stormy one day the wind's coming from one direction, another time it's coming from another direction. This will change the direction of longshore drift, 
it'll change whether the waves are coming in at an angle or perpendicular, so how much energy is being dissipated. But also spatially speaking, beach shape makes a difference. And I want to mention, although this is going over quite a lot of stuff we've mentioned in another video, I want to mention ords at this point. Ords are big hollows in the beach and they seem to focus erosion onto particular areas because they're deep, um, they seem to allow destructive waves to get in, which is like a big hole in the beach basically. You get them especially on the Holderness coast. Ords move around, they move out to sea and they move along the beach, but where they are you're going to get more erosion. So there are many factors that lead to different types of erosion and it leads to a constantly changing set of landscape features. It's not always erosion that puts an area at risk. Sea level change and other factors can also affect coastal flooding. Now some areas are much more at risk of coastal flooding than they are of erosion. Basically a coastal plain or any flatter area is most at risk of coastal flooding. Less likely to be an erosion risk, although there, there may be, due to the factors we mentioned before, some changes in erosion patterns, either short term or long term. But coastal plains tend to be depositional features, they tend to be low energy coastlines. So it's more about the flooding that's the risk. Coastal plains such as the east coast of the USA uh, are very much at risk. Estuaries as well, like the Thames estuary where rivers meet the sea, they tend to be flatter because rivers flatten out the landscape at estuaries. And also river deltas, so deltas such as the Nile Delta, the Ganges Delta in Bangladesh is particularly at risk, very very vulnerable. The reason is that actually a lot of people live in these areas. Coastal plains are very good for tourism, Estuaries are very, very good for trade, and deltas are very fertile soil, hence the Nile um, and people living there in Bangladesh. So, but they're greatly at risk, so people are taking a huge risk by living there. Facts that affect coastal flooding are height of the land, higher it is, less chance of coastal flooding. Makes sense. Subsidence. Has the land sunk down? So height is sort of like the natural height of the land, but there's also, has the land subsided because of isostatic sea level change? Maybe it's subsided because of eustatic sea level change, sea level rising up, which we'll come back to. Vegetation. If the vegetation is there and it's not been removed, then that's going to uh, dissipate some of the effects of flooding because the vegetation will not only absorb some of the wave energy as it's coming in, but it will also soak up some of that water and retain it like a sponge. So vegetation, not only good at preventing erosion, good at preventing flooding. Now storms and storm surges are slightly more complicated. You don't need to know the in-depth processes for coasts as to why a storm causes a surge. If you do want to find out more though, check out my video on depressions, because that will explain that, but that's a different matter. What happens is a storm creates low pressure. It basically sucks the air up from below and it rises up in anti-clockwise spinning motion. It doesn't have to be a tornado to do this. Any storm will release the pressure. And if you release pressure, take away the air because it's rising up, the water bulges up to fill the space. So as a storm moves across the ocean, it carries water with it. So it carries this bulge, almost like a tsunami. And so a big storm will pull a big bulge of water in and it'll create a surge. It'll create a temporary rise in sea level that can flood a location. There have been some areas that have been very uh, much at risk of this. We get it quite a lot in the North Sea. There was a very famous one in the 1950s. There was also one in 2013. We get them quite a lot and due to climate change, 
or we assume due to climate change, the evidence is <laughs> pretty much there, it seems to be happening more and more. So these uh, coastal plains are at much higher risk and these factors tend to lead to more flooding. So we've looked at how coastal erosion, sea level change alter the physical characteristics of the coast. It's all linked in again to this dynamic equilibrium. It's all linked into the idea that the coast is dynamically changing through time and space. If you've got any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching.